and thank you everybody for uh, giving us those uh, the insight. I'm happy to say that today we have an author conversation between Clemens director Paul Erickson and Sarah Blackwood. Paul began as the Randolph G. Adams director at the Clemens Library in January, so we're happy to have him on board. And Paul, I'll let you kick it off and introduce Sarah. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, thanks uh, to everybody for joining us today, and thank you so much, Sarah, for being here. Um, uh, I, I would say that the, the main way I choose what to read is um, reading books that friends of mine have written, because I have a lot of really smart friends who write fantastic books, and so that is why I was so excited to um, talk with Sarah about her book today, which I have right here. Um, you can sort of see um, the covers on the screen. Uh, so Sarah Blackwood is Associate Professor of English at Pace University in Manhattan, where she is also Director of the American Studies Program, and soon for her sins will be Chair of her department. Um, <laughs> So congratulations. Um, Sarah received her, her BA from uh, the University of Virginia, her MA in English from Illinois, and her PhD from Northwestern. Um, she is the co-founder and editor of avidly.org, which is a, um, now part of the Los Angeles Review of Books, and it's a wonderful um, channel where public intellectuals write uh, cultural criticism. Uh, it's one of the my first stops um, uh, on the internet to read about interesting books and movies and uh, ideas. You have probably read Sarah's writing uh, on parenting and 19th century literature uh, and or television in the New York Times, the Hairpin, Slate, uh, the New Yorker, among many other outlets. Um, and we are delighted to have her here today to talk about her new book, which was published earlier this year uh, by UNC Press, The Portrait Subject, Inventing Inner Life in the 19th Century United States. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to do this. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, every book started somewhere. Uh, and at the Clements, we like to think that um, a lot of them start in libraries. So how did you come to the topic for this book? What, um, what's the origin story? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, there are a few different origin points for the book. Um, it grew out of my dissertation, which is the most common <laughs> sort of uh, origin point. Um, but it did actually really grow out of work in archives and libraries while I was in graduate school. Um, just running the gamut from um, working with the microfiche machines at Northwestern's library um, and, um, and actually doing um, some teaching at Northwestern where there was a nice small special collections there, but they had a nice um, kind of variety of visual material. And I would bring my students, I taught like a, I taught like a couple different, like I taught a realism class and I taught, you know, where we would do like early photography. And so I'd bring students to special collections. Um, and then I also, while I was in um, graduate school, I had a fellowship at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, and that was a real kind of like door opener for me um, working in the archives that they have for um, American art. Um, and so, you know, it was dissertation, which sort of had a, um, a pretty common um, origin, which was like, I'm doing all this reading and I'm noticing um, some holes in the scholarship. You know, I'm noticing that so much of the literature I'm reading um, is, um, is sort of full of these portraits, but I hadn't really run into, you know, people were right, scholars were writing about it, but um, I just felt like there wasn't a robust conversation about what all of these portraits were doing in the literature across a, like, you know, around like a 70 year period um, after the invention of photography. And so I was like, okay, so there's a hole there. Um, you know, I had ha always had a, um, an interest in what I would term like everyday artistic or cultural forms, like mm -hmm. just in, from television or romance novels, you know, the, these like very like kind of banal everyday forms. Right. And I started to think of portraits as one of those kinds of forms, which I think sometimes have a harder time breaking into scholarship because they're not exceptional. The vast majority, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got your your John Singleton Copley or a sergeant, like those are exceptional portraitists. But the vast majority, you know, 95% of the portraits that are in the world are not exceptional. They're very like banal everyday form. And those kinds of cultural forms, I think sometimes have a harder time for like, for like to spark interest in, in scholars. Uh -huh. um, and so that's like, a, you know, there's a whole kind of stew. I also had worked in an art museum before I went to graduate school. Um, so a lot of my kind of art education happened like 
on the job or in an archive um, rather than like a, you know, a scholarly, you know, an art history major or something like that. Um, wow. So all of those things kind of come together to <laughs> inspire the project. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, so for people who have not read the book, um, it is a wonderful set of uh, close readings of texts by authors like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Frederick, du Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, uh, Henry James, as well as um, an analysis of visual culture, um, especially photographs and, and painted portraits. Um, Thomas Aikens is probably the best known painter that you talk about in the book. Um, uh, and you're, you're really interested in how writers use portraits to think about um, sort of what what an inner life is um, yes. and, and sort of how that idea changes over the course of the 19th century. Um, in every book, um, uh, there's a person or a story that you had to leave out um, of your cast of characters for some reason. Um, so what's one person or one story that you really wish um, you'd been able to find a way uh, to get into the book but just didn't make it? Um, well, what I, I would say that um, there's a number of figures and it's very mm -hmm. funny. I, I have gone back to look at the proposal and what I thought <laughs> I would do with this book. Is very, it was, you know, it was, it's, you know, I like that I had the confidence. Right. <laughs> That's what I, um, I would say that um, actually rather than a specific character, um, if I were going to do it again, I would probably try to figure out how to um, do a little bit more gender analysis. Some of the figures that did get left out were Emily Dickinson um, and also Elizabeth Keckley, who's an, um, who is this wonderful 19th century uh, black writer who had been enslaved, but, uh, and then uh, became uh, uh, um, Mary Todd Lincoln's dressmaker during the Lincoln presidency. Um, and she's a really fascinating person. Um, so there are like, I actually, I've kind of written on those figures elsewhere in articles, et cetera, but they kind of, I couldn't figure out a way to kind of really corral them into the um, into the, the story of the book as a whole. And really when I pull out and think about it, it's that I part of what was happening is that I really couldn't figure out, even though for me, a lot of, um, I'm really interested in how gender kind of shapes visual representation of selfhood and of, you know, of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, it was like too much to manage because I also do a, ton, a lot with race and it, was, it ended up being like a, a lot to manage and I couldn't totally figure out how to, how to put, it, put it in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the really fascinating themes running through this book, which is, um, an analysis of visual culture and of the history of psychology and, and also the history of technology. Um, one of the really fascinating themes um, in the book is, is that of the mind um, or consciousness as, um, and especially uh, different ideas in the 19th century about where in the body consciousness was physically situated. Um, and this is a, you know, a really old question. Um, you know, it goes back a long time and, and thinking about medicine is sort of what, you know, what is the difference between um, mind, I guess, you know, 500 years ago, people were maybe talking about the soul instead of the mind right. in this way. But um, can you talk a bit about those conversations that you chart over the course of the 19th century? And especially, why did it matter so much to people to talk about where consciousness physically lived? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like a, it's, it's a pretty primal question. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I find that my eight year old is like, often asking, asking these questions about consciousness. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, I, don't know it. I don't know. Um, and so I mean, you know, I the way Okay, so the first thing to say is that there's this great historian of science, actually, like a historian of psychology, his name is mm -hmm. Edward Reed. And he wrote this book um, titled From Soul to Mind. And it's like about the development of the discipline of psychology from Erasmus Darwin to William James. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I encountered that book in my early in my like research, it kind of snapped some things into focus for me. And that idea of like moving from soul to mind, I think is really sort of, it does capture a lot of um, the how thinking develops about inner life and consciousness and like just all of the sort of metaphysical um, kind of human qualities and how they develop over the course of the 19th century. Um, what's interesting is that so I mean, in the in the most like, basic way, you know, the idea of the inner life as being soul or spirit, right, is this earlier kind of religious um, mm -hmm. set of ideas about um, what 
um, you know, what, what inner life is, you know, is sort of, you know, it's, it's moral content, um, what drives it, right, where it comes from, etc. Um, and so there's, but there's this weird um, tension that happens. So on one hand, you have thinkers moving, driving towards like a scientific explanation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's like how the mind comes in. And there's this great moment in, um, 1850, this guy, John Bovey Dodds, he was a, univer uh, a Unitarian, uh, no, Universalist minister. Um, and, um, but he was like, he came and he gave a speech to Congress. <laughs> but he came and gave a speech As to one Congress. does. Yeah, like to Congress about what he called electrical psychology. And he was, he was really like, he was in, it was 1850. So it was actually kind of on the early side of some of this, you know, the kind of what ends up being like the science of mind, but he was really making this argument. And in his argument about like, we need to like have a scientific approach to figuring out what consciousness is. He really is directly addressing people who would be worried that that's an attempt to push religion out of the questions of like mm -hmm. consciousness and humanity. Um, so everybody is like concerned about the relationship between those two things. Um, and, but the thing that's weird is that when I looked, I thought so many of the earlier, so even prior to the period I study, and then also on the early end, like the 1840s, 1850s, mm -hmm. there's still this very somatic or embodied sense of inner life. You know, it's like, there's not that kind of like strong um, distinction between what's your body and what's your mind. And so um, even, so like, even in the thing that, I don't know, sounds to me, more disembodied soul, right? Mm -hmm. I found like in the texts and in the writings from the time, a real interest in like, like figuring out like what part of your body, like you said, like there are these earlier theorists that are like, maybe consciousness is in the spine, you know, like a real like sense <laughs> of like, you know, this sort of like embodied um, aspect of psychology. And then across the 19th century, it just gets increasingly disembodied. Um, and so even though you move into this like materialist science where they're like trying to measure reaction times and, you know, just trying to do like all this like scientific research on, mm -hmm. on like how consciousness is produced, um, you get these sense, especially in the writings and in the art of the time of inner life being very disembodied and like your sense of yourself as being like trapped by your body or alienated from your body, like a real like stronger um, distinction between mind and body at the turn of the 19th century. And that is like, if you, and when you go and you look at, especially a lot of the art and the, and the development, the like development of all these like kind of uh, free and direct discourse techniques of stream of consciousness and, you know, literature really moves inward and is like really wow. interested in just like what's going on up here. Um, and then in a lot of the art, you get these these um, images of like people who just look exhausted. <laughs> like they're just like, you know, they're just like sort of, they just feel, they look trapped by their body. Like they they have this rich inner life, but their body is like trapped or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a lot of like kind of the story. And one of the things I think is so interesting is I feel like a lot of the, the earlier, like the late 18th and early 19th century embodied ideas about psychology are so interesting and I think that they've kind of they're coming back around with mm -hmm. um, in our popular science cultures of thinking about the connections between the the gut and the brain or you know like the, those sorts of connections that are kind of circulate today there's like a return to that idea of selfhood and inner life as actually being into integrally related to the body. Mm -hmm. There's a I mean, there's a fascinating discussion in the book about um, the post Civil War um, experience of, of amputation um, mm -hmm. and especially a short story um, where someone feels that he has lost consciousness because his his limbs have been uh, he's lost his limbs um, as mm -hmm. a result of wounds in the war and the idea that his consciousness in some way lived in his skin because that yeah. was the way that he and that was his portal um, to the outside world which is really right. I mean, the 19th century was a very traumatic century with, especially with the civil war right in the middle and it act to me. So it's like, there's actually a lot of, I, it, I, it makes sense to me that almost like, like a common culture would like move away from the body after this like totally traumatic um, war that was deadly, but also like a lot of casualties, a lot of really injured bodies that like kind of reenter the world. Mm -hmm. 
And I think about, like, I actually have been thinking about it, you know, now everybody's talking about, okay, so um, we're going to come out of this particular, like, pandemic moment having a really different understanding of community, social space, contagion. Um, and I think, like, now I'm like, oh, this makes sense, right? Like, of course, like, you have this war, there's all these injured bodies, and then it's like, there's a general move away from, like, wanting to think of your selfhood as being that injured thing it's like something it should like okay let's think of it as something separate or something and so then you get into this like kind of disembodied turn of the century um set of ideas right so you we you touched on religion um just briefly a bit ago and so one origin story of american literature and it's um a deeply flawed one but it's one that we at least all know um is is sort of early puritan writing and especially writing about the process mm -hmm. of that was part of conversion. Um, mm -hmm. and so this is a, a genre of writing that is entirely about the inner life. It's about examining your soul for evidence of salvation. Um, uh, and in, especially in the chapter in the book about Henry James, the entire, and William James pops up occasionally. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I'm thinking, well, William James is writing the varieties of religious experience at the same time, peering over his brother's shoulder. Um, so can you talk a bit about what some of the religious dimensions are to the shifts that you um, chart in the book and the way that people thought about the inner life? Yeah, I mean, so I, the way I always think about the Puritans is actually, it's this outside in kind of direction, right? So mm -hmm. it's sign, it's so what you say, it's like this introspective, like I'm turning inward, I'm like scouring my interior to figure out like what any of it means. And then, but at the same time also like, I'm really reading the world for its signs. Did my house burn down? Does that mean I'm saved or I'm damned? You know, like all of those sorts of, you know, all of that Puritan kind of sign reading. Uh -huh. But I always, I really think of that as like an outside in kind of um, um, like motion, uh -huh. um, which I think has a real religious component. Um, and then, but what happens I think in, as the 19th century progresses is it switches and you have this inside out and then you have so much interest in expression. So like, you know, and then a, a, di a different, a related but different set of questions. Like, can you trust that this, you know, the, the way that this person is representing themselves is honest or true? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, like, can, is there some way to, um, in art, like actually pull all of that mess of consciousness, pull it out and put it someplace else on the page or in somebody else's mind or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this like motion, I feel like changes over the course of, of, um, of the, of the, of the, of the century. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of the Jameses, it's interesting because Henry James, he, he, I think he kind of comes towards like, he's like part of it, but almost like he's interested in this like inside out, but then because he's such an interesting, to me, I think an interesting experimental writer, he starts to play around with that. So in all, in all of James's uh, stories about portraits, they almost never function the way you think they were. He gets really interested in portraits that like, there's like a portrait of somebody, but it's like, it doesn't re actually represent the person or it's mm -hmm. like, there's a, you know, a portraitist paints a picture of a person and then it turns out to be a dead ringer for another person that they've never met, <laughs> you know, just like all of these sorts of, um, and I, and, and then for um, William James, the varieties of religious exper experience, I think one of the things you get is that instead of the Puritan, like outside in, you have like a very, like, here's God sending messages, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of like, you know, it's like a telephone. It's like our modern telephones. Just, there's just one line, wow. there, right? But like the the way that Jameses, I think, are working is that the, when you have the thing going from inside out, there are multiple lines, right? And it's like the old fashioned. It's like the party line, I right. feel like. You know? And so you know, and so for some people, it's then kind of reconnected, and it's about like for James, William James, sorry, um, it's kind of like about being connected to some sort of like broad religious, but no longer like singular string. It's like this broad oh. religious kind of, you know, um, sort of set of experiences, right? Uh -huh. uh, and so it's like, it's like has multiple lines, I think, rather than that singular Puritan kind of mode of communication. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so um, the way that we think about portraits now um, is usually 
of a, a person sitting or stand or standing still, like yep. not really doing anything, right? Um, uh, and the the sort of technological change that your that brackets your book, um, which is really elegant, is sort of the invention of photography in 1839 to the invention of the X ray in 1895, which are both static right. images that sort of yeah. fix a person in place. Um, but at the same time, over the course of the 19th century, there's this whole interest in technologies that will reflect motion. So yeah. whether it's zoetropes or other kinds of persistence mm -hmm. of motion um, uh, devices that will let you see images move, culminating with um, motion pictures at the, in the, in the, at the end of the century too. So how did those efforts to put images of people into motion connect with what you're talking about in the book? So here, yeah, I think that's really interesting. And here's where um, I do have, this is like where my like kind of visual culture theory polemic comes in <laughs> where um, like, so I take, yes, they're like a, like a photographic portrait or an oil portrait is a, is a static visual form. But one of the things when I talked at the very beginning that, okay, so in the beginning of my, my research, I felt like there were holes in the scholarship. Mm -hmm. And one of the things was that I actually, I thought that I realized that the people who, most scholars who do write about portraits really like to put a pretty like, like narrow definition box over what, first of all, what a portrait is. And then also would most scholarship is like, um, here's a book on daguerreotype portraiture, or here's an analysis of, you know, oil portraiture is like kind of like really divided up by medium and, and genre mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, but what I started to think about was that, okay, so this form explodes over multiple different media and genres over the course of this um, period. And then I actually also started to think about how, for example, in our contemporary culture, so if you just take the example of the word selfie, mm -hmm. um, it has a narrow definition of just like, it's a picture you take of yourself with a front facing camera. So it has like a narrow genre and also technolo visual technology definition. Right. But if you actually do survey like social media, people use the word selfie in this totally like broad definition way. So like you'll see stuff like a picture that's obviously taken by like a professional photographer and people will be referring to it as like a selfie, et cetera, right? So I got interested in that like broad sense. Uh -huh. And one of the things about the broad sense of portraiture is that it incorporates any given portrait, it may be static, but it is plugged into this cultural imaginary mm -hmm. that is produced by um, writing about portraits, commentary on what portraits are. So like for today, every selfie taken is surrounded, I think, by like, you know, people like editorializing on, on whether selfies are stupid or cool, you know, or et cetera, right? And so I thought, I really think about portraits in that way in the 19th century. Um, and so if we think about it that way, then actually that move towards like animation and moving mm -hmm. portraits, um, and or even like the move towards like the x-ray, like moving inward. Right. I think a lot of scholars think of, of the x-ray and the invention of cinema as like a like a firewall like break where it's like now we're in modernity right but the way i really thought think about those late 19th century technological innovations as as really connected to the 19th century projects that happened on in so many different genres so like in the literature in the newspapers in the illustrations, in the high art, in the everyday art, like all of this stuff right. together was really like kind of working toward a, a, a combined interest in both getting inside, like figuring out what's in there, right? Um, bringing all the like what's in there out and, the, and, um, and then like and animating it, right? Like bringing it al alive. That's what so much of the literature about portraits does is like trying to, to take the idea of a portrait and turn it into something that moves uh -huh. um, yeah so I, I'm like I just like I really am like I love the 19th century and I'm like it's not it what they knew what they were doing <laughs> like, so it, it was already animated I guess is my right point. <laughs> right um, so you have you have one of my favorite quotes um from uh from Roland Bart um in the book from Camera Lucida where where he calls a photograph a, a certificate of presence mm -hmm. um and and as you show really uh, really wonderfully in the book African-American writers in the 19th century continually were confronting the absence of 
fully human black people from the visual culture of the period. Either um, black people were just not present in the portrait galleries that they talk about, talk mm -hmm. about or they were um, just racist caricatures. Um, so can you talk a bit about the connections between um, race and visual culture in, in the period that you look at and especially how they connect to notions of individual selfhood? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I started to, um, you know, you have on the one hand in the 1840s, Hawthorne mm -hmm. is like obsessed with the idea of the portrait as re revelatory. So all of port all of um, Hawthorne's um, like writings about portraits are like, ooh, maybe like the portrait's going to reveal a secret, right? <laughs> and so, and he's a little, am he's ambivalent about it, but he's obviously also kind of excited about that idea. Um, but then when I really started paying attention to what black writers um, and m most of the figures I study are Frederick Douglass, who just talked so much about the visual, um, Harriet Jacobs, Hannah Crafts, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Frank J. Webb, um, who is um, a um, mid 19th century or kind of later 19th century um, novelist. And so, um, and they all in their different ways kind of address portraits and also the visual. And they have a totally different set of theories about, mm -hmm. about what they might want from a visual representation of the self. Um, so where many of the white writers from the period are obsessing about like revealing secrets or taking all of the stuff that's inside and just bringing it so that everybody can see it finally, right? Um, many of the black writers are skeptical of that because they already know how vexed visual representation is because they're constantly confronted with racist depictions of black people and they see them and they're developing this whole other set of theories. Um, one thing that I really think is interesting is like in the case of somebody like Frederick Douglass who really explicitly writes about portraiture and also mm -hmm. just about visual representation of black people um, is he develops a set of I, I really think of him as a visual theorist. He develops a set of visual theories about um, the this about perspective, about um, the instability of vision, and how you kind of can't totally trust what you see. Um, he develops this whole set of theories that actually, in like the mid twentieth century, the big theorists start being like, "Oh, I have this new idea about." <laughs> visual representation, it's not actually objective. And it's like, well, there are so many black writers in the mid 19th century who are already really explicitly doing that visual theory. Um, and so, and there's lots of like, Harriet Jacobs has this great story about, you know, she, she was nanny to this girl, um, uh, the daughter of Nathaniel Parker Willis, um, who was a big writer at the time. Um, and she had to take her charge to go get her portrait painted in New York City. And on the, you know, and of course, this is going to be this memorializing white girlhood. You know, she was, I think uh, her charge was like 13 or 14 at the time when she was getting her portrait painted. Uh -huh. um, and then, but at the same time, Jacobs can't get picked up by a streetcar. So she's a nanny to this girl. The streetcars won't stop for her because she's black. So she has to veil her own face, <laughs> right? In order to get picked up on a streetcar to go to the portrait studio to just you know, do her job basically. Um, and so, you know, and there's, you know, there's a number of different interesting stories like that, that put directly together, like what white people want or expect or think about portraits. And then the perspectives that a lot of black writers had on just different perspectives on what like portraiture might provide um, mm -hmm. for them. Right. I mean, this connects really well to a conversation that we had on last week's installment, which was about um, photography and identity. Uh, and one of our panelists talked about Frederick Douglass and the fact that he was, you know, probably the most photographed mm -hmm. American of the 19th century. And sort right. of how, um, how did his thinking about visual theory affect the way that he, I guess, was it driven by the fact that he was photographed so often or did it shape it or what was the relationship between his thinking about visual culture and the way that his um, public image was put out before the world? Yeah, I mean, he was excited about photography and I think he thought, like he really celebrates photography's democratic. Um, he he like has this idea about photography as a democratic art form mm -hmm. and he's definitely part of some of the earlier um, like that early moment of photography where there's excitement over the um, 
the ability to have have more objective representation. But Douglas was never like Pollyanna-ish about like, oh, finally, here's this representative representational technology uh -huh. that will remove stereotypes or something. He knows that that's not going to happen. And so he has this excitement where he's like, look, we need, and he has this, he has a great, he has this great commentary on, on, on like portrait galleries. And he has like a list, he kind of creates his own portrait galleries in his writing where he'll list like prominent uh, black intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, where's our portrait gallery of these people? And here's like the list, right? So you get this idea of like, of like a gallery hung with black faces rather than, you know, all of the white faces that sort of like surround you. Um, and so, but so he, I think he's like excited about this democratic potential, but he's also, he's, 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 he understands like how photography too could be used mm -hmm. to um, further stereotypes. And so, so much of like his, I think it, I think it actually drives his like getting himself photographed and circulating his image mm -hmm. and his image is so, um, um, he's really attentive to his pose and how he represents himself. And I don't think like, you don't have like, as the 19th century progresses, there's a real fascination with I, the idea of like authenticity. So, and that is, goes back to what I was talking about with all these exhausted looking people. Like the idea that like, okay, we're not gonna flatter people visually anymore. We're gonna show them as they are. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be like exhausted by modernity. And, you know, and they're gonna be like, they have like all of these intellectual thoughts that they can't express. But I, Douglas is like, he never plays that game. He's like, I am like a professional public person. Here's my pose, I'm powerful. And you don't get the sense that you're getting a lot of like him, his self like revealed. And I think that that was like a deliberate kind of protective measure. Like you don't get to come in here. You know, I don't trust you that, you know, that sort of idea. Right. Um, so I see that we have uh, questions in the Q and A and that there are a lot of comments in the chat. So Angela, do you wanna um, uh, ask some of those? Sure. Um, although first, I want to ask Sarah if you'd like me to go back to oh, the I know. I forgot. <laughs> I totally forgot. presentation. Yeah. Um, you have some wonderful uh, images there that maybe you'd like to talk about. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I and I actually I was just like, oh, I totally forgot. So, um, oh, actually, can you start on the Copley first? Is that one in there? Is Everything there? starts with Copley. There, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So there are these three um, images that I kind of they're in the introduction of the book. And I, for me, they, they worked as like little like pins or placeholders in my own thinking. Not that I like talk about all of these in depth, but I call them like, these are the pink ladies. And I think one of the things this helps exhibit is how portrait um, high, these are all high art examples, but high art portrait conventions change from the like 18th century to the 20th. So in this example, which is a John Singleton Copley, you know, you have this like this image of this woman that basically what the point of this painting is to like exhibit wealth, right? To um, to kind of like represent her um, her kind of um, her sort of propriety through pose, and she has she's holding a number of like emblems that sort of like flat like floral representations, the Delft vase that. Um, represents um that also represents wealth and like this sort of sheen of her dress is like that's money right like you know mm -hmm. and so you have this like all together you just generally have this portrait convention that's just that's about a you know there's some personality here but it's like pose comportment gesture um and it's all about like exhibiting her wealth social status and propriety as like a woman um then when you move we can go to the next one when you move to a later um, portrait, which this is one of my absolute, this is actually one of my favorites. And I, Thomas Aikens is a, is a complicated character. He was not a good guy, <laughs> but I really love Aikens's portraits. They're really interesting. Um, but here you have an example of um, this, this portrait, which is just so different. You know, she's still dressed in pink, right? But now you, this is one of these exhaust, like these portraits of kind of exhaustion. She's sort of like swallowed by her fabric her whole body is sort of like curling in, you know, she's looking towards some kind of um, like sort of source of illumination, but it's like she's separated from it, right? Um, and so now it's like, okay, what are we trying, you know, we're, we still have some of the markers of propriety in the like feminine, the folds of fabric and the femininity, right? Um, but it seems to be that whole like idea of like 
propriety comportment seems to be sort of collapsing at the late 19th century. Um, and Aikens is, I always think of the, top, the subject of this painting as really being her exhausted inner life, kind of entrapped by what in Copley is like something that is proudly inhabited. Um, and then the next painting is a 20th century. This is Gerhard Richter's Betty, which is actually a, a portrait of his, um, his daughter. It's photorealistic. Um, one of the things that's interesting, this is one of my favorite paintings. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting is she's actually looking backwards toward uh, one of Richter's abstract gray paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and so this now, the portrait is like not about resemblance. It's not about expression. It's not about like propriety. Like it's almost like it's now like the portrait is about the convention of portraiture itself. You know, it's like, but because she's turned away, you're forced to like encounter this alienating experience. You expect to see somebody's face in a portrait. Um, and now she's looking at this other work of art you know, and this, and you know, and you still have the gesture and you have like the kind of pink, but the subject of this painting is just so different. And so if the next one just kind of shows them all together, I really, the next slide, yeah. So I really think of those three as kind of like showing a lot of what happens in um, like, you know, in the, in the Richter, I think of the subject of the portrait as being portraiture itself. It has that late 20th century, almost postmodern referential meta quality, um, which is interesting. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> and oh yes, this, and this, type um, this, Yeah, so this is like when we were talking about, uh, this is um, an example of some of what black writers and black people like are just surrounded by in ev everyday life. You can see this is literally, like this is where the word stereotype comes from, the little piece of type that is used to create, um, to create um, little you know, images in, in newspapers or other printed material. And this is from a case book, which was, um, I looked through a bunch of case books at the Newberry Library in Chicago when I was in graduate school. And this was just like, it would get like, it's a kind of like, um, printers, um, it, professional printers material that would get, you, a newspaper office would get it and they decide what pieces of type they might want to buy. So they could, um, they could include different images in their newspaper printings. Um, and Douglas uh, explicitly references these stereotypes and these case books in an editorial that he writes in, in, um, in his own newspaper, The North Star. He has this great editorial where he says, we don't buy those things. Like the, that bottom left, you can see the, the image for the like, the kind of, um, you know, fugitive enslaved person at the bottom left. And it's all just like, it's the same as a boat, as a barrel, a bunch of barrels, a horse. It's like on the same level. And Douglas is like, he's like, when those case, we don't buy that piece of type <laughs> at this newspaper, right? And like, and so I love that kind of explicit reference where you get that sense of like, He's going, like he run, he's running a newspaper. He's like thinking about what pieces of type to buy and he's got a page through that, you know, and he sees that stereotype. Um, and so, and he writes about that a little bit. And so that, and I think that contributes to a lot of his own thinking about visual representation. Right. And then here is just another, this is from Douglas where in My Bondage, My Freedom, he has this great, on the right is a passage and he just has this, this uh, ling uh, linguistic, like just sort of like literary reference. Uh, there's the image does not actually show up in My Bondage, My Freedom, but right. he just sort of says, look, I don't remember my mother, but what, the, what I do remember is that she looks, she looked a lot like this illustration that I saw in John Pritchard's Natural History of Man. And then just has this offhand reference. It's like, she looked like Ramses in Egyptian. <laughs> and it's this great reclamation where he's like, my mother looked royal, right? <laughs> like, you know, she had, you know, and, um, and he says, and I don't have, and at the end of the passage, he says, I think of her with so much fondness, but, you know, I don't have an image of her to look at, like most people have an image of their departed loved ones so that they can look at. And that, I think that reference where he says, look, we don't, as, as Black people, or especially as formerly enslaved Black people, we don't have the visual record that many other people in the society do because we've been pushed out of like having that kind of visual representation. And so then he invents this other one. She looked like a right. little Ramses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow, thank you. I, I, those, those were great. 
Um, <laughs> we do have several questions, but since we have the slides pulled up, I'd love to do just a couple of housekeeping things. So everybody just uh, hang tight. We'll, we'll answer questions for a while after this, but just in case any needs to get off of the program this way, um, you have some information. So if you enjoyed today's session, you um, may enjoy our upcoming Discover series. Uh, we were planning to do a one-day in-person program on the history of photography as it relates to the Clements Library, and our wonderful graphics staff has uh, divided that up into four virtual sessions, so you can sign up for that. And in addition, the um, Michigan Photographic Historical Society is uh, partnering with us um, as well to bring Jeff Rosenheim for a virtual talk on May 30th. We don't yet have the exact link to the program um, because uh, they're working with Jeff on that. So you can go ahead and register and then we'll send you a link. Um, but it is, Angela, it's, it's, the talk is gonna be about um, photographs of people working. Um, so yes. it's gonna, I think it's going to be a really fascinating talk. It is. It is exactly so. Um, yeah, he's he's his work is on those. Uh, his talk is on those sort of first photographs, those oc occupational portraits. Um, next week for the bookworm, we're returning to our panel uh, format. So we'll be discussing biographies. Um, biographies on some really interesting people and Emmy Hastings, Peggy Harrington, and Andrew Rutledge will be um, leading those discussions. So thank you for that and join us next week for those. Uh, last week we asked for feedback from people uh, about whether or not you would like to see the bookworm continue after the stay-at-home order ends. And overwhelmingly, the answer was yes. So we appreciate we appreciate your enthusiasm, and we're a little overwhelmed by how popular this has become, and very thankful for um, this opportunity to learn every week and to connect with all of you. If you did not have the opportunity to participate in that poll at the end of the bookworm last week, we have replicated it on um, in a Google form. So no need to fill it out again if you already did, but if you'd like to give us some feedback, uh, we'd love to, to hear it. So go ahead and click on that link and, um, and help us out. We also heard from a lot of people that you'd be interested in merchandise um, uh, featuring the bookworm. And so we'll be, initiating a contest soon to design an emblem and that should be really fun and we appreciate everybody's enthusiasm for that as well. Uh, in addition, of course, many of you already support the Clements Library financially and we thank you. Um, you're really important to the work that we do and to furthering the interest and study in an American history. So if anyone else out there would like to give, we'll uh, drop a link in the chat right now, and you're welcome to do that. Um, and if anyone has offered um, to sponsor a future episode of The Bookworm, I'll be in touch as well about that. We just wanted to get our schedule figured out before reaching out to all of you. So thank you so much for the, the many people who indicated an interest in that as well. Okay, so I think we're ready to get back to the Q&A. So let's see what we have going on here. Um, I noticed in the chat, someone was asking about Elizabeth Heckley, who you had mentioned earlier. Um, they were trying to uh, locate information about her and thought maybe they had the spelling wrong. Yes, it's Keckley with a K. K 
Okay, here I could I can actually type it in the chat. Hold on. <laughs> and, and we can we can send a link to her um, her memoir as well. Yes. <laughs> um, and yeah, her memoir is called Thirty Years a Slave dot 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 and four years in the White House. It is one of my absolute favorite. It is a really interesting, weird book <laughs> with lots of gossip and um, just really interesting perspectives on the Lincolns, just different than um, any other. <laughs> she's, she's just wonderful. It's just really, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a great book. Okay. So let's see. Um, we have a question. People are curious to hear you talk about how your ideas regarding portrait function are related to class structure mm -hmm. and the fact that portraits, both painted and photography, went from being a luxury item to something virtually anyone could have taken. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit of uh, connected to what I was talking about earlier, where um, you know, you have, it, it, it happens so, it also, it just, I can't overstate how quickly this new art form gets integrated into the culture after the invention of photographic technology in 1839. Um, you know, really within a year, you have a lot of portrait, uh, a photographic portrait sort of like, um, you know, uh, you know, apparatus studios, et cetera, kind of just set up and it's very quickly pretty affordable. Um, and so it's a it's a, like a fast shift, right? Um, and um, and so you know there's this wonderful um, one of my favorite historians of 18th century um, U.S. art traditions is Margareta Lovell, and she has this book called Art in the Season of Revolution, which is a really um, interesting um, study. Um, and she has this great set of she has a discussion of portraiture, and she's sort of and she's the earlier period, and she so this is like for the the kind of the wealthy in the colonies and then in the new um, United States. Um, so, you know, for the wealthy and then also for the middle class, um, the kind of, you know, the merchant classic, um, you know, she talks about how um, for those people who were living in what becomes the United States, portraits were for from the early 1700s were like the art form that, um, you know, um, that these, that these, you know, colonists and then early Americans would purchase for their homes or commission for their homes. So there was some kind of like tradition sort of like set, like more so than like a history painting or a landscape even, which landscapes had such a strong, um, such a strong standing for like rich people in England, for example, in the in the 1700s. But in in what becomes a U.S. portraits were like always like one of the things. Um, and so you have that kind of like set up that is here's this art form that the the people like the one percent can access. Um, um, and then you have this like technological invention that all of a sudden really allows um, almost everybody to, or not, a, not a, but a lot, a lot, a lot of um, uh, citizens to be able to get portraits. Um, and so that happens quickly. Um, and, um, but one of the things that, that does happen that is interesting is like related to what I was saying earlier is that so much of the portraits that start kind of getting churned out, daguerreotype portraits or carte de visite, or um, you know, tin types, et cetera. They really, there's so many of them and they very quickly become kind of, um, they're not exceptional. They're very, it's like going to the Sears portrait studio and you're just sort of like, you're getting them to mark certain things that happen. Um, somebody goes to war or somebody gets married or you know, maybe somebody uh, goes to college or you know, like there's, Hawthorne is a good example. He has like, he gets these portraits done like he has like seven portraits that he goes and gets done at like all of all of the like required moments in his life <laughs> like you know um and so they they're very like you know the poses are the same the expressions are really similar the clothing is the same right so they're so different from that high art tradition that was um that um that was for wealthy people who wanted to like display all of all, everything that they could buy, right? Um, and so, and so that the class dimension is really interesting, I think. And part of what really drives my interest in thinking about portraits as a real everyday form that um, that um, and I really do think that even even the most banal, uh, you know, unsurprising, you know, sort of like 
three quarter, <laughs> you know, kind of like portrait. They, I think they all mean something. I mean, I was really interested in, in trying to think through, um, you know, how that worked, um, especially kind of intellectually in the, in the time period. Thank you. Um, we also have a question uh, asking you to talk more about how your research on selfhood, consciousness, and interior experience is impacting how you see our contemporary moment. Are you seeing these same themes expressed now as we struggle through this extraordinary experience of isolation? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this one thing that is so interesting is now this, this, like this setup, like the zoom and like all the like floating heads, I haven't been able to like, I don't have the presence of mind right now, because I'm also, you know, now an elementary school teacher, in addition to like all my other stuff that I'm doing. But like, I have not really thought it through, but it is wild, you know, that this is now, and it's this, Paul, like your question about, okay, well, what about the you know, what about the animate, the animation? Right. So now we've turned all of these selfie technologies, the just the front facing camera, um, which has been static from, right. I think it's 2007 is when the front facing camera comes in. And, uh, and so 2007 to 2020, that's like selfie. And now it's like the, the Zoom or, you know, Google Meet or like these sort of like, like floating head things. Um, yeah, I mean, I I have thought a lot about like the I, the selfie, right? And how you know one of the things that I think is interesting is that you have a technological invention, so similar to photographic technology, kind of getting invented. And so, in some cases, that can, or in, from one perspective, that can be that can be a neutral evolution right it's just a it's a new technology right like right so here's the new thing but what you see in the case of the selfie is that um i and i really thought back on my own you know like how i started to represent myself is that your subjects kind of shift when technologies shift and the perspective you can get on um and especially when your subject is a person that the way that that person is represented visually um, or also in literature, but like the aesthetic dimensions of like how a person gets represented actually has a really strong feedback loop with how then people understand what their selves are. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, the invention of a front facing camera is just a technological innovation that's driven by you know, desire to make more money <laughs> on the part of like tech companies. Um, but then it really drives like, how you think of yourself um, moving through the world and how you experience space and how you experience your own image and then how like that experience of your own image drives inward and kind of like can shift around ideas of what you think that your self is. And so I take a lot of that contemporary, um, I really did think a lot about, okay, so we, we have been living through a really similar intense shift in visual representation of selfhood in a similar way that people post 1839 did. And I like to think of those two things together. And one thing you can notice is that it doesn't feel like a huge revolution, right? You're just like, oh, my phone works this way now and I'll take a picture of myself, right? Like it doesn't feel like, oh, here I am doing this big like philosophical shift. But I do think that a, a major shift happens in, um, in thinking about, um, you know, what, you know what um what the content of yourself um sort of is and then all of the editorializing people get so mad about selfies because they say oh this is this is vanity or it's you know it's not interesting or now everybody is not experiencing themselves authentically because they're always thinking about how to pose themselves so they'll look a certain way in a photograph and all of that is related to anxiety over what a self might be is it something is it the experience of authentically living you know in the moment or is it like the idea of like thinking of yourself as being able to look at a picture of yourself at a later moment or something like that yeah <laughs> that's funny in the chat people's bathrooms <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> um the technological advances of photography through its development offered a believed truth of events people places etc are there any similar cases of infallibility that can complicate portraiture in the 19th century in the way that the Richter portrait of the 20th century offers? 
Well, there are a lot of, I didn't, I don't talk too much about this in the book because it's just, there's, I mean, there's a lot to say about, <laughs> about all of these things, but even in the 19th century, there is, um, there's, there's this weird way that at the same time, people are saying, oh, photography, here is, now we're going to have the pencil of the sun. That's uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes' phrase. Like, people aren't going to interfere in visual representation. We're going to get the thing itself, right? So there's that idea of, like, perfect correlation between the world and then the image of the world that photography is going to usher in. And we're going to remove people <laughs> from the equation, or we're going to remove the artist from the equation, right? So there's this whole set of ideas of that happening. But at the same time, from the very beginning, uh, photography is also thought of as, um, as um, malleable, um, uh, a little bit magical, probably not true, you know? Um, and one, actually a, a book that I really like on this, um, which is, it's not, a re it's not a particularly recent work, but is Miles Orville's The Real Thing. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, um, he, that book is just really good on trying to talk about both of those things at the same time. So if for 19th century people, they could hold multiple ideas in their head. So at the same time that they're like sort of celebrating the objectivity of photography, they're also, they understand like we do today that f Photoshop, you know, can make something untrue in, in a certain way. And so he really like, he kind, he kind of really investigates those, how those two things work in concert with one another. And so, you know, in the 19th century, there are all these examples of, you know, uh, spiritualist photography is kind of like running this, this sort of like making this sort of, um, um, you know, is, is so spiritualist photography are like, okay, here are these images, and then they're uh, they're depicting like the presence of a ghost or something in the in the in the frame. And so on the one hand, the idea is like, oh my God, photography can capture this like this magical element of the afterlife, right? That we've never been able to see before. And I think and people believe that at the same time that they're like, this is probably not real. You know, like there's, and the, the, they both, they almost always work together. And there's like that hucksterism kind of quality too. And there are a number of different kinds of, of ways that those two things I think work together where it's like photography is both truth and also false, you know, like sort of like, you know, creation or falsehood or, or you know, how the uh, question asked um, fallibility or something. So it's this, this idea of like, oh, we might be finally at the point where we have perfect representation, you know, like, like the sort of like, you know, the, the biblical idea of like finally being able to pull back the veil of like fallible human perspective. But, and it's like, maybe, but then I think most people understood that that was also, that not really happening. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have maybe one more. Um... Lex is asking, wasn't the Edgar Hundley novel, and Kathleen says it's neurasthenia, something okay. that raised a lot of these issues very early in American literature? Uh, neurasthenia? Um, well, interestingly, that uh, Amelia Van Buren portrait, she, and she's later, but um, she, uh, she's diagnosed with neurasthenia, um, uh, sort of... Uh, um, a kind of like illness of her nerves. She has this great quote where she says, it's so, I'm trying to remember exactly how she puts it. She says, it's so hard or exhausting or something to, um, to feel so everlastingly ill and be told that the trouble is all in your head. There's it's something like that. She's a, she was an interesting, I, I actually would love to pursue um, research on her, Amelia Van Buren, who's the sitter in um, Aikens' portraits. She was one of his students and he likely sexually harassed her and was inappropriate with her. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of um, not great stuff uh, between the two of them. Um, but like this idea of like the exhausted, like that feeling of exhaustion that really comes into visual representation at the end of this of the century, which um, a lot of thinkers are connecting to like the exhaustion of modernity. So all of these new technologies to like stressing everybody out and draining your nerve energy and you know all of the ways that modernity like drains away um, from your selfhood. Um, but there, a lot of the seeds for that are in those the earlier kind of works, um, the um, you know like the the sort of like representation of um, 
uh, I, so, so the person is asking about Brockton, Charles Brockton Brown, right? Um, and like, so there's the representation of like, you know, um, madness, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of psychic sort of breaks happening amongst people. And for Brockton Brown, which is earlier, the late, uh, you know, the sort of late 1700s, um, that is often tied, I think, to like, that idea of you can't necessarily trust people anymore and you can't trust their, their you know, we're, we're sort of like, we're getting loosed from that one-to-one -one Puritan, like godliness that's coming from here and going in you. And we're getting loosed from that. And now everybody's like breaking down mentally. Um, so that's how I would think about how like that, that particular thread of like neurasthenia. And then by the end of the 19th century, it has like a science name, a scientific name, whereas, earlier it's like madness or it has a, has more got like a kind of gothic quality that's not necessarily considered totally it's starting to be considered scientifically but that happens later i think yeah. all right well thank you so much um sarah this has been really an interesting thank you this was fun <laughs> thanks sarah yeah it was really good to talk <laughs> and Take thank care. you to everybody who sort of logged on this was it's really nice to just feel like we're in some kind of community. <laughs> it's really nice. And, and it was nice to see the names of so many C19 friends popping up in the I chat. know, I know, I loved it. <laughs> great. Right, thanks so much. Thanks everyone, have a great Thank weekend. You. Have a good day. Bye-bye.